Before we begin, I wanted to give a huge shout out to the folks at Amazon Music for partnering with us on this episode of the Inside Line F1 podcast. But more on this later. Right then, let's get right into today's episode. The guy with the fastest lap in qualifying didn't start on pole and the guy who won the race on track didn't win the race eventually. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the 2024 Belgian Grand Prix. Madness, chaos, anarchy in some way, we've got it all. And let's add another thing to the mix. Oscar Piastri lost the race on track by 1.1 seconds. Had he not braked... 10 metres too late, or maybe a couple of metres too late in the pit lane during his pit stop on lap 31, he would have saved a couple of seconds. He lost the race on track by 1.1 seconds. Just to put it out there, we could have had anyone winning. And we're not even talking about the man who started on pole Kunal. This is what Formula 1 should be all about. And at the inside line F1 pit stop in Mumbai... We had 140 people experiencing the race live at social together. I can't begin to tell you what the vibe was like. What was it like in the Viaplay studio when you were doing your TV work over there this weekend? The vibe was that for once, we were we were really scratching our heads so hard to understand what's happening with strategy. It almost seemed like a Formula E race to me, you know, <laughs> that... There, there, there was there was a point of time when there were five or six drivers all in it to win. Okay, uh, there was Verstappen, there was Norris, there was Piastri, there was Leclerc, there was Hamilton. Suddenly came Russell out of nowhere, mm. and you were like, you couldn't really predict who actually could have won because all of them had the pace to win. And yeah. you know, I, I also kept waiting through the race. Yeah, when is it that the Ferrari will? roll back fall back in its actual position guess what they didn't i was then waiting when is it the mercedes is going to fall back you know and the fallback would have meant that mclaren would have left them and then pulled a gap and then mm-hmm. max would have eventually caught them and pulled a gap that and then chased happen. the mclaren Not, nothing of it happened and my goodness i mean i don't want a four-week gap to the next race i want the next race to come literally the next weekend because if this is what the 2024 Formula 1 season is going to be, then I want 52 races. A race every weekend. Yes, yes, I remember. This time last year, Belgian GP, I I remember being very tired. One o'clock in the night in India time. All of us were recording the review. It was a particularly average race. And I was, I remember particularly discussing the point, do we need 24 race weekends? Do we need time to miss Formula 1? I raise up my hands and say I was wrong. We don't need time to miss Formula 1. We just need competition. If this is the blueprint of what Formula 1 should be like in the Liberty Media era, I am here for it. Because what we saw at the end was drama, not just for the Formula 1 broadcast, but for Drive to Survive too. Imagine losing out on your best ever race win without any doubt. That is one of the best Formula 1 drives in the modern era. But now, there is a caveat to it. 1.5 seconds, 1.5 kilograms. That every lap canal has to account for a tenth, tenth and a half somewhere. And in a race where he just won by half a tenth, I I don't know what to feel anymore. By he, I mean George Russell, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there is, of course, a weight penalty that one either has or doesn't have in the case of George. The minute you are a lighter car, it's of course faster. Around Spa, maybe it's a little far, little little more, the weight penalty is a little more because it's that longer lap, so to say, and it's, it's so many mm. undulations and so on. And uh, firstly, I have to say this, it's a Mercedes operational error. I know uh, thanks to David Froft and even more so Bernie Collins, uh, the former head of strategy at Aston Martin. She gave a great insight, uh, something uh, Sundaram uh, spoke about in the pre-race show as well. There isn't a cool-down lap, yeah. so they couldn't do the rubber pickup uh, in Spa 
which probably was one of the factors that George Russell, firstly, he wore his tires down too much by, you know, extending his stint as long as he did, right? Ooh. But my point is, my point is, Fernando Alonso, who finished P9 and now is eighth, also did a one-stopper, right? So it's it's not, also did a one-stopper, let me finish, also did not have the cool-down lap to pick up rubber, yeah. but wasn't underweight. The scrutineering sheet after the race says that. I know why. It's because Aston Martin cannot drop the one thing that Mercedes have dropped this weekend, the sandbags. Ha ha ha! The <laughs> word is back! We have used it for the first time since Bahrain 2021 and I feel incredible. The sandbags are really off. Uh, uh, so let's put it in context. Uh, how many laps he did? He pitted on lap 10, didn't he? Which means 34 laps on the hard compound tyres. And by the end, I remember him losing around a second to Lewis Hamilton per lap. On an average, give and take, sometimes 1.2, sometimes 0.6, sometimes 0.8, thereabouts within that range. But that much, but to still win on merit when the team has said, go ahead and fight in cars that are now theoretically closer to racing. That clearly means that Mercedes is not just there on luck. It really is there with a combination of two things. A car that can genuinely withstand pace in clean air, which Lewis Hamilton consistently showed by being roughly eight tenths faster than Oscar Piastri on average in the middle sector. Yes, McLaren were running a low down for setup, but eight tenths faster per lap on an average? It's no joke. That car is fast. And that's on the old floor. The new floor was used because Mercedes didn't feel comfortable going to a new setup in con- tricky conditions. It could well make the car faster the next time we go to the Netherlands. So, th- we we have legitimately three big teams fighting for race wins every weekend. And to hammer that stat in even further, four out of the last, what, three out of the last four races? I almost had a Rahul Gandhi moment. Three out of the last four races have been won by Mercedes Kunal. It's, Who it's, would have imagined? Not me. Not me. Yeah. I mean, when they won in Austria, we were like, yeah, the, the top two protagonists crashed out, which they did. When they won in Silverstone, we were like, yeah, it was too cold a condition. And Lewis Hamilton in those conditions and mixed weather, always great. And, he, and they won. George Russell here pulled a strategic masterclass. What a call uh, uh, to, to sort of extend the tire uh, as he did. And uh, to pull off that win, nobody expected it, not even Mercedes. And to me, Samuel, there are two things that stand out. Firstly, of course, he had a lighter car, like you mentioned, maybe a tenth. Uh, if even if that's a benefit, that's a benefit. You got to accept that. The second is uh, the track actually got quicker mm. as the race went on, and that was an insight George Russell shared post race, saying the track went quicker, which meant meant that even though he was running out of tire uh, life, so to say, he still had a track that was getting quicker and the evolution was higher because they all started on a green track and the third but the most critical thing is why could Lewis Hamilton with DRS not overtake George Russell it was not down to a lighter car it was down to setup choices George Russell had a slightly lower downforce setting that he opted for all through qualifying and the race and guess what that was one of the reasons Lewis (laughs) Hamilton couldn't catch him so, the reasons why people have won or not won a race this weekend. Uh, engine penalties, choosing a different setup between high or low downforce, messing up a pit stop, not having a car within the legal weight limit, and having a slightly messed up start. I still count that, Lando Norris. This should have been and could have been your win. Piastri was good. You are better as it stands right now. This could have been yours. So, Five key reasons why people didn't win. That truly defines what Formula One is all about. And to talk about all of this, we have the Inside Line F1 podcast. We are India's best sports podcast, as awarded by Hindustan Times. And the top 1.5% of all podcasts listen across the globe, across all podcasting platforms. My name is Somal Arora. I'm the voice of the MotoGP Indian Grand Prix the Indian Racing League, the Indian Formula 4 Championship, the Indian Supercross Racing League, and also the Carlos Sainz Fan Podcast, which today is on a bit of a holiday. But as always, Kunal Shah is here with me, the former marketing head of the Force India Formula 1 team, which has had a bit of a reincarnation and has scored points in its new avatar today. We will talk about that in a bit. 
and he's also in fact he was rather also in fact working on the live tv broadcast of the formula 1 races in norway for the viaplay network if you were in norway you would have seen his face on tv one talking point kunal that we we need to understand in all of this is that as much as it is a win taken away from russell it is a win that has been claimed by lewis hamilton his start was impeccable his runs in clean air were honestly champion like and his composure all across when having so many different cars behind him on different strategies was a masterclass this is very much a lewis hamilton win and again a driver of the day performance had it not been topped by russell and his incredible performance i think we're seeing a rejuvenated lewis hamilton you know initially when the season started he was cryptic something's not clicking my side of the car congrats to george for doing this <laughs> but suddenly when the mercedes has brought these upgrades made it easier for them uh, to drive the car to extract more lap time in in, a, in an easier way lewis is there he's the one who's now taken two wins of course he inherited the win today but there's also this question you know mercedes did not sabotage lewis hamilton by mm. any chance in the race today because he was like you said in free air running up ahead leading the race uh controlling the race and what just happened is drivers around him who he was competing with ended up pitting and mercedes decided to not have him being undercut by those drivers so they said let's pit him in the meanwhile george russell said can we try going for a one stopper and mercedes was like yeah why not because george was way back yeah. and and you know was nowhere messing with the front runners at that time and suddenly it seemed like it was working the tire was not giving away and then you like i have track position the one stopper seems to work something <laughs> that no pre event simulation actually said could happen so let's just make it work which is why lewis was so upset post race because a he of course lost out to a one stopping george russell who was not as quick as him this race weekend point number 1 point number 2 it was a different strategy which probably mercedes didn't inform him about as early as they did could he have extracted more pace could he have done something different to go and win so that's why lewis actually said it on the post race press conference and then in the cool down room saying i had more tires each time they asked me to pick right but each time mercedes asked him to pit was just to make sure he doesn't get undercut but i still believe there was something left on the table had he been told slightly earlier or had a bit of an idea again i don't think maybe maybe if mercedes told him earlier he would have been able to extract more from the tires but the point is did mercedes know earlier as well i don't think they did because as you mentioned earlier it's a very good point kunal it was a green track when the simulations happened in fp2 1 and fp2 and by green track a big part of it is not having enough rubber laid down spa has just been resurfaced and formula 1 cars are running here on the new surface for the first time and when it gets rubbered in and has more grip on it eventually it becomes easier to drive faster and less harsh on the tires which is a big part of what happened today and we were all confused we were all shocked pirelli told us that the ideal limits for the hard compound tires would be 18 laps fair which is close to what most teams adhered to but russell did 34 on them and yes he was losing time but eventually he had track position which we all thought would be practically useless at spa because of how long the straights are here it, it this is it's like going out of the chessboard to kill another piece you didn't know that could happen until it actually happened it's it's phenomenal you make your own rules on the way and fair play to mercedes they did that and i the only question in my head right now is what would you have done if you were toto wolf because at our inside line f1 pit stop in mumbai where we had so many people joining us and sharing their opinions on the race as it happened and also after it a lot of people and i agree with them said that yes toto did the right thing he did the right thing by making sure that they didn't race do you feel in the same boat kunal somewhere or should they, they have prioritized they actually, lewis no they, why should a team prioritize a driver it's a one two it's like what mclaren did last year uh, last race weekend they just wanted a one two they wanted to secure their one two that's what mercedes were Oops. doing they secured their one two they just told them you're free to race but leave each other space which is actually better than being told hold position something some of the other top teams end up doing as well the the other point to remember is when we look back in hindsight 
it seems like George Russell had a brilliant strategy call, which he did. But imagine if his tires blew up. When I say blew up, I don't mean physically. I mean, you know, they gave up five or seven laps before the end. It has happened, you know. Kimi Raikkonen, yeah, yeah, in it, 2005. In fact, Lewis Hamilton wasn't at the 70th anniversary Grand Prix, finished on three wheels in, mm. in Silverstone. I think that was a bit of an accident rather than them extending. But yes, that can indeed happen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, so what if George's tires would have given up on him? Then Lewis would have anyway taken the win, right? Yeah. So what Mercedes was doing was they were just going for an absolute gamble with George. Because let's also remember he started eighth, the last of all the top drivers. <laughs> yeah, there, exactly. Right? And suddenly out of nowhere, he's got track position. And then he's like, I can extend, I can extend. And they decided, let's go and extend. So, uh, the, of course, Lewis has said, you know, he leans on his strategists. He trusts them just that they didn't tell him beforehand but like we are asking maybe Mercedes didn't know beforehand this exactly. was going to work out they were taking it a lap at a time saying oh competitive times let's continue competitive times let's continue and maybe that's just what happened but you know what I've learned from this it I've learned that even though Lewis Hamilton might be leaving the team Mercedes will not lack in a leader and this is phenomenal what do you want your lead driver to do in a race you want them to qualify well you want them to sustain pressure you want them to pass decisively when the need for that arises. And you want them to be excellent at tyre management. Four qualities that George Russell in this season has exhibited very, very well. And also picking up the pieces, which is also something he did very well a few races ago. I don't think Mercedes will ever feel the void of a lead driver per se. They will feel the void of Lewis and the feedback he brings in and the environment he creates and the kind of advice that he can give to people around and help build the team around. But the lack of a number one driver, per se, won't be felt. And in my eyes, today marks the day when Toto's George Russell project is complete. He has what he wants. That's a very, very good way to put it. Toto's George Russell project. But and then he can start to look at a new one. Kilos, ah, yeah, true, which is true. the Toto he, Kimi project. Uh, who also <laughs> got an, an amazing move on the inside at Orush crazy blows my mind but you were right and they fell short by 1.5 kilos on this whole project we should actually explain what happens Samuel, because yes we know what what happens post race uh the fuel is drained out the car is expected to be at the minimum weight level car plus driver and that's supposed to be 798 kilos like fia has explained and then george russell ended up at 796.5 right so that's what happened. And when you're underweight, it's a, it's a straight out disqualification. There is no protest. There is no, um, you know, there is no uh, argument. There's no debate. There's it's just, that's what it is. And the FIA calibrated their scales in case the reading was different on the two scales, but the scales turned out to be well calibrated as well. So George Russell, incredible race, incredible strategy, and an incredible way to get disqualified. Yeah. Unfortunately. And he falls back to eighth place. He had overtaken Checo Perez for seventh, but now he falls back to eighth place. And Lewis Hamilton now wins exactly, was it 11 years since he scored his first race win for Mercedes? I wow. think, yes. And he scored 84 wins here. Even if you were to take that George Russell and Lewis scored 1-2 or at least crossed the line 1-2, it's the first time since... I think 50 or 60 years sawmill, maybe more actually, that there are four teams that have scored a 1-2 finish in the same season. Are you Can kidding you me? That? Ferrari yeah. too. And then One of course, day. yeah, Ferrari had... Oh, had Australia, one, two, was it not? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Oh my word, what a season we are having. Wow. Wow. And it's the sixth race in a row where <laughs> Paul hasn't converted to a race win. Formula One, ladies and gentlemen. And you thought the sport wasn't coming back. Oh my word, it's back in hell. It, I, oh, so good, so good, so good. But also, interestingly, uh, the 44 coincidence is real. Someone on Twitter, and I know I should do my due diligence better by checking out the source, but whoever it is, you've done an excellent job. I will get back to you and I will retweet that one. But someone on Twitter found something very interesting that I have to read out now. 
the 44 coincidence behind this race. Uh, it was at 50 bucks VT. Number 44, Lewis Hamilton. 44 laps in the Belgian Grand Prix. 4.4 so seconds. So those two we can confirm. Those, those two, two we can, can confirm. confirm. Yes. Yeah, yes. The third thing we can also do, which is 4.4 seconds, Oscar Piastri's missed pit stop, which I mentioned in the top, which had he nailed it, would have been potentially a Piastri win. And also, document number Which also 44, we can confirm. Which also we can, we can confirm, confirm that. Exactly. Yes. And document number 44 was the document issued by the FIA, which read out that George Russell has been disqualified. You believe in numerology, Kunal. And you bring out some very interesting stuff. This is it. Which also I can confirm. It was document number 44. So, document 44, infringement, car 63, technical non-compliance, wait. Published 2807-2024-1853, Central European time. Yes. Which you can find on the FIA website. We're not kidding. It's actually yes. document number 44. It's So there we go. Numerology. And then, of course, 11 years since the first race win that he's had with Mercedes. So, so many beautiful stats and facts and coincidences have popped out that maybe now it's time to move on to something else, Samuel, because we've, of course, have had several conversations about Mercedes, Lewis, Russell. Who do you want to pick next? Ferrari? Oscar Piastri. Oscar Piastri. Let's Man, do Oscar I'm, I'm Piastri. Gutted. I'm yeah. gutted. And I mentioned at the top, that pit stop, I mentioned it a second ago, it's a driver error. It's a clear-cut driver error. Piastri break too late in the pit lane. Nothing the Jackman can do about it, even if, even if he's a huge Jackman. <laughs> but yes, the point is, uh, you, Jackman, was on the Alpine. That's the problem. Oh, but he anyway. was. You're right. Deadpool versus Wolverine. Nicely done. Well done. <laughs> That's the kind of stuff you do before you're about to sell a Formula One team. But <laughs> but the point being, it's it's a driver error. Clear as day. And Piastri gained 14 seconds in the last 13 laps, even though he was running on a slightly low downforce setup. And had he closed up, he would have had theoretically... A bit of an advantage over Lewis, who was running a slightly higher down for setup, and George, who was on very old tyres. This should, could, and would have been his race win had it not been for that. But the thing is, you've got to look at it as... Uh, you've got to put it in context of things completely. Oscar Piastri is still only in his second Formula 1 season. He's only born in 2001. So for him, it's quite a big learning today about how to adapt to these things. And the fact that he passed the clerk with such composure was incredible. And I think it's good that he's learning on the brightest stage and under the biggest lights because that's where you mature a little bit more. And today, time management, which was traditionally his problem, didn't turn out to be that way. So I'm glad to see improvements. Yes. You mean there's there's yet another race which... McLaren can add to the could have won in 2024 box, right? Because it's just something that Oscar will learn. Uh, You know, I'm glad the the front jack man was checked, but not hurt. And uh, that caused a 4.4 second. Maybe he just had to play to the whole numerology card out there. But Oscar (laughs) Piastri was quick. And, you know, Zach Brown said that if the lap, if the race was a couple of laps longer, he could have probably won. But the truth is, it had to end on the 44th lap because of numerology reasons. So it is it is what it is when it comes to uh, Oscar Piastri. But I think incredible. I think McLaren was just not there in the, the mixed weather qualifying or the wet qualifying because they had set up the car for the race day. And the fact that both McLarens were just less than half a tenth away from each other shows that that was the pace of the car. And both drivers actually drove to the pace of the car. But Lando, uh, what do you make of his his abilities and his racecraft lately? Uh, I know, I know that the start is just one moment out of an hour and a half race, but the weightage attached to it is disproportionate by some margin. And today, he didn't have the best of starts again. Unforced error out into the gravel. That is that, that's where he went from P four to P seven. By the way, at the start. And the moment you lose three positions at the start, it is near impossible to get them back, even though you might have the fastest car, because everyone was so similarly matched. I feel it's a big miss. I, I think, yes, the start 
sort of has a higher weightage on a lot of things. But that's because these cars are difficult to pass. Also, track position is vital, uh, especially when the cars are so evenly matched. And another thing, Sommel, which we actually almost discussed in the preview, but didn't really say it up front, was that, uh, you know, uh, the DRS train was making it, di- it difficult. First, Lewis Hamilton was leading a DRS train for the top 10, and then Fernando Alonso from ninth or 10th place was really leading a DRS train for several laps. So, uh, you know, it was just down to that. And Lando eventually just lost it at the start, lost three or four positions when he did, and that was it. And everyone saying Lando and his driver's championship and so on, even on a bad day, Max Verstappen is still finishing fifth. Whereas Lando Norris, <laughs> Lando Norris uh, got outscored by by Max Verstappen. So let alone the points that he lost in Hungary, he just lost more points in Spa. Oh yeah, yeah. Even on a bad day, Verstappen has actually extended his championship lead by two points. That is the Max Verstappen effect. That oh, is, and, and while and starting, Max, sorry, go and on, while starting seven places behind. Yes, and Max Verstappen has now finished fifth in three of the last four races, exactly the races that Mercedes has won. And his previous fifth, three fifth place finishes were spread across like five seasons. Okay, sure. So that's how it's been for Max Verstappen. That's just how it rolls. And, uh, you know, Red Bull, I would say. Could have had more, but they just chose to bank on the wrong tire because they had the medium, medium hard for Verstappen and Perez. So they were very pleased with how much they, how fast uh, they, they still managed the race uh, with uh, with uh, Max. They said they optimized it, but when it came to Perez, and we you know, I know it's easy to just point at him, but he's run, you know, a large. He, he ran half his race on the wrong tire, and that just sort of did him in. Yeah, completely. Completely. Uh, but I is that the best he could have done? Checo Perez? I, I believe so. But, you know, he was just being overtaken because when he was on the medium, everyone else was pulling uh, out all on tops. Uh, and I don't think there was a single driver in the top eight who did not overtake him. Okay. And again, out here, I, I strongly believe, Somil, that uh, track position and even more so clean air was vital. Mm. We saw the minute Oscar got clean air, he said, clean air is king out here. And you said very well yourself how George Russell and Lewis Hamilton made the most of clean air, right? I don't believe the Red Bull cars had too much of clean air, even more so Checo Perez. So it was all in all just down to circumstances and the very fact like Max has been pointing out, we just don't have the quickest car anymore. And not only had, you know, has has McLaren caught up, but you're... Ferrari and Mercedes were not that far behind for yeah. you know Red Bull to just you know overtake and drive drive past them. Yeah, uh, and again, this is a very funny circumstance now where Red Bull need a second driver more than they ever have, and this is where we are hearing reports that there is going to be a meeting between Helmut Marko and Christian Horner and the other decision makers at Red Bull Racing about what to do with Sergio Perez. And yes, that qualifying would have helped out. But what we saw in the race today probably didn't. And Red Bull didn't do any favors by putting Perez on that strategy. But I, I want to bring back the years a little bit to your time at Force India Kunal when you were also in that team. I, I just want to understand the psychology of the break. Because I hear the MotoGP World Feed commentators say it quite a lot. And I've seen that also happen with... Some racing drivers close to me on a on a national level scale. But if you have a terrible race or an extremely good race right before a break, it tends to impact your psychology as an athlete. Does that impact the way the team views the driver as well? Because the driver, of course, will have that impact. But does that play on the team's mind broadly and their decision making or their perception of the driver? Of course, it it does. After a point, everybody's in the sport to win. Nobody participates because, hey, I want to finish fifth place and be happy with it. Uh, So, you know, every single factor contributes to uh, performance, uh, whether it's uh, an upgrade you're bringing, whether it's a sponsor you're bringing, whether it's a press release you're sending, or whether it's a driver you're hiring, whether it's your number one, number two, or even the simulator and, and the reserve drivers. You want to take these decisions, keeping in mind that everything is going to make the car go quicker because that's what this business is all about. No, but does it, I mean, 
just like uh, they say right the empty mind is the home of the devil in hindi in a way but does that mean that if you have a longer break which means more time to think that a negative performance has a greater impact on the perception because if there's a race the next week and you probably brush it off and be like ah screw it we've got to focus on something else anyway there are, there are two parts to this first is you're only as good as your last race weekend we know that mm-hmm. even though you and i are now 40 episodes in by the way happy birthday to f1 stats guru he's not here because he's somewhere what's his birthday what's fernando alonso's birthday. birthday also uh, oh my as oh is wait fernando alonso let me wish him a happy birthday <laughs> yeah yeah congrats congrats on points <laughs> yeah Congrats on Fernando for scoring a point but yeah back to what i was saying you're only as good as your last uh, race weekend right much as we are only as good as our last interview that we do with one of the paddock personalities or the last episode we've released last insight we've cracked last interview we've had etc right mm. so uh that's one thing but having said that the teams sift through a lot of data a lot of uh situations that they know they could have controlled couldn't have controlled before they make a driver decision they won't base a driver decision just based on one or two results they will see trends they will see uh um, they will see succession plans and and uh, you know how how does a particular driver fit in now versus fit in 3 years from now and we all know helmut marko has said in fact on via play that they will sit on the monday after the race and in general discuss about the future uh racing car drivers who will race for the red bull brands so is checo perez uh, under discussion even though he has a contract i would like to believe he absolutely is just given the vast gap he has had to max verstappen in 2024 hmm so that's perez we had a few other notable things in the race as well f1 stats gurus but they made fernando alonso p8 for aston martin that's good Esteban Ocon, Alonso's best friend in the points as well, P9. And ah, huh, is that No, oh, hang on a second. Is that the Ricardo scoring P10? Yes, yes, that's also a story too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So some some sort of chaos in the midfield as well. So it's it's been a fun race everywhere in a way. It it, it is and I I I believe uh you know this is I think how many teams have scored points and the top 4 teams, 7 teams scored points because uh no well not really six teams scored points because ocon and ricardo are there but great great uh performance by ocon you know he announced he's going to haas everyone questions always every time it says tabano ocon he just has that perception in the wet he put it in q3 he's made use of that position to uh deliver points when alpine announced that there's going to be yet another change in their management yeah exactly and i finally feel that haas has a settled driver lineup interestingly in their 9 year formula 1 history haas has had two experienced drivers in their lineup for eight seasons in the one season where they didn't we got to witness the magic of nikita mazepin and the struggles of mick schumacher wonderful pure vibes peak memories i love it but now for the first time haas are in a situation where they have an aggressive experienced statesman of sorts in esteban ocon which is important by the way because they need someone to fight for the points with their elbows out because they barely are ever in there so when you are in there you need someone who's going to put their life on their line for it Esteban Ocon will do that and they have a youngster who has a very high potential to go up ahead so for once i feel Haas are moving in the right direction with their drivers and with that happening with Mercedes winning races with Ferrari getting pole position with Red Bull now slipping up and Verstappen still doing a great job and McLaren dropping the ball once again and there's chaos everywhere it's it's like formula 1 is back what a way what a way to spend a weekend yes and and since you mentioned Esteban Ocon he has jumped Alexander Albon for 17th place uh in the drivers championship uh he's got 5 points uh Daniel Ricardo after a very tough start to the season is actually just 10 points away from Yuki Tsunoda who by the way is on equal points with Nico Hulkenberg since Hulkenberg hasn't scored in two races himself and Hulkenberg and Tsunoda are just two points away from Lance Stroll for 10th place in the drivers championship since wow. the drivers championship is always what we enjoy the most but when it comes to the constructors championship Mercedes have pulled a mammoth number of points on uh on 
pretty much the top three teams, I would say, uh, in the last five or six races. So in the last six, seven weeks, Mercedes has gone incredibly, uh, you know, charging ahead. And if this is the trajectory, Samuel, could Mercedes even target Ferrari's third place in the Constructors' Championship? Uh, at the moment, it's about an 80-point gap. But if they continue the way they do uh, and the way they've been outscoring uh, Ferrari, you never know if that's something uh, that, you know, that could go their way as well. And knowing Ferrari, they wouldn't even know what hit him. <laughs> that's, that's just the way things go for them. Oh, man. Yes. Carlos Sainz, since you're, of course, disappointed with him. He oh. said some. He said two really funny things. Of course, the first one was not funny. After qualifying, the reason why he was so off Leclerc is because his tires started to overheat and he didn't really have them in the right window, which is fine, fine understandable. The second reason why he, uh, what he said was funny was post-race. Even the chief strategy officer of Ferrari, who is Carlos Sainz, was puzzled at Russell's one-stop strategy. And of course, he immediately jumped on to say, Maybe we should have tried the same strategy. And why? Ooh. Because there was a point of time when Carlos Sainz was running in the top three before he had to pit because he started on the hard tyre, if you remember. And they were contemplating a one-stop, you know. And of Sundaram and I watching at the event were baffled, thinking, ah, huh, should we consider that as something? Should we track that? And we very conveniently said, nah, let it be. They're probably going to box him anyway. And they did. But we should have tried that because that, that, I mean, you never know. Sometimes these nuggets end up slipping away until everyone collectively realizes, oh, wait a second. And that moment of, oh, wait a second. I, I, I know I'm going on and on about it again, but man, I wish you guys were here with us uh, for, for our event in Mumbai because you could collectively see heads turn. People be like, ooh, something's happening here. Something's interesting. Until they started hearing the radio message and they were very clearly aware that Russell was about to win. What? Man, this is this is great fun. It absolutely is great fun. I can't wait for the summer break because I know we always have specials planned, you, me, and Sundaram. So uh, we've had 14 races. That's more than 28 episodes that we've done. We've had Otmar Safnauer. We've had several other guests who've come and gone, who, you know, Ravi Shastri, of course. So we've had a fantastic first half of the season, including all these events that social organizes and invites us to host them. 140 people is absolutely, uh, you know, more than 100% capacity at social. But that's what people like to do. They love to watch races with us. And and that's also why one of the reasons we are, you know, awarded uh, India's best sports podcast. And India's best, best sports podcast will be on a small break for a few days. We We need to calm our minds down. But again, as is the tradition, there will be an episode every single week and the content never stops even in the summer break. A mid-season review will be here, a list of things, very interesting things that you must have missed in the season, but we spotted will also be here and we're trying to get a few interesting guests on the podcast too, as we always are. So there is no reason to tune away from us. The world of Formula One might be sleeping, but we never are. Which is descriptive by the fact that it's 1.52 in the night and I should probably go to sleep. Which is why, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And this has been the Inside Line F1 podcast. Please wish a very happy birthday to F1 stats guru Sundaram. And we will see you in a week's time. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. And oh, by the way, make sure you are not underweight. Is that the right thing? Just, is that a thing? There is. Yeah. Absolutely. The way you can be overweight and obese... In real life, you've got to make sure you're not underweight either. Absolutely. Lesson learned. Lesson learned. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of the Inside Line F1 podcast. Before we ended, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to Amazon Music once again for partnering with us on this episode of the podcast.